obalescence from black, black scholars. Ooh, I'm gonna hit the awesome. So this series is hosted by the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology and the Department of Anthropology. I'm Kara Larson, a PhD student here, coming to you virtually by way of the University of Michigan on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Wyandotte, Miami, Souk, Fox, and others. I do want to acknowledge the early and ongoing entanglements of the history of this university with indigenous and black communities. To quote the words of historian Taya Mills, the University of Michigan was born out of a compromise made by native people in the context of a century of colonial warfare and land dispossession in the Great Lakes. It was built on ill-gotten land and funded from wealth derived from slave labor. With this, we'd like to recognize the 1817 treaty at the foot of the rapids with the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations and reaffirm their ancestral and contemporary ties to this land and the contributions of both black and indigenous peoples to this university. The title of this series is in many ways self-referential to both the legacy of this museum and department in the future we hope to chart. Given the outsized role our department and museum played in the formation of the so-called new archaeology, our legacy has become entwined with it. Here I want to recall a comment by Mark Leon in reviewing what is perhaps the most iconic volume of the new archaeology, Sally Lou Binford's New Perspectives in Archaeology, where he said in 1971, suddenly the new archaeology is everybody's archaeology. This lecture series is one of our initiatives working towards making that sentiment true, to become an institution that promotes and practices archaeologies by and for everybody. The faculty, students, and staff voted on a slate of speakers and collectively decided to invite six Black scholars whose research speaks to the topical, epistemological, and ontological diversity in archaeologies today. I am beyond ecstatic to introduce you, uh, Deborah Hurd. Deborah Hurd is a PhD candidate in anthropology, specializing in the archaeology of ancient Nubia at the University of Chicago, where she has also studied the ancient Egyptian history and language and Egyptology. She situates her research at the intersection of anthropology, archaeology, Egyptology, Nubian studies, African studies, and Africana studies. Her dissertation research analyzes the inscriptions and iconography of upper Nubian Kushite temples dedicated to the gods Amun and Apitamak, as it relates to the mutual rights and responsibilities of the royal family, the gods, and the people to ensure the proper functioning of the Kushite polity. In 2007 and 2008, Deborah excavated at the fourth cataract of the Nile River in Sudan as a member of the Oriental Institute Nubian Expedition. For more than 10 years, she has taught courses, given public lectures, and participated in special programming dedicated to ancient Nubia and Egypt at the Oriental Institute, the Kemetic Institute, and Chicago State University. And she currently serves as adjunct lecturer in the Department of Black Studies at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Deborah has also served as an intern in the Department of Egyptian and Nubian Art at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and as a curatorial assistant in the installation of the Robert F. Pickin Family Nubian Gallery of the Oriental Institute Museum. She is a member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, the Sudan Archaeological Research Society, the American Research Center in Egypt, a new member of the Society of Black Archaeologists, and the American Sudanese Archaeological Research Center. And most recently, she serves as the organizer and founding member of the William Leo Hansberry Society, which is committed to providing African descended people with access, opportunities, and training in the fields of ancient Nile Valley in Northeast African studies. Today, her talk is titled The Barbarians at the Gate early Black historiographical attempts to redefine Nubia's place in world history. This event is co-sponsored by the Doctoral Program in Anthropology and History, Department of History, Department of Afro-American and African Studies, the African Studies Center, Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology, Department of Classical Studies, and Department of Middle East Studies. Before beginning, a few more brief notes on today's technology. First, viewers have the ability to turn live transcripts on and off. 
Throughout the lecture, you are welcome to utilize the Q&A function to ask questions and upvote those you would like to see answered. We will turn to these questions at the end of the presentation. Now, with all that said, I will be turning things over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Kara. All right. So as I begin, I would like to thank um, the museum and all of the associated departments that she, that Kara just named, I can't name them all, um, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share with you today. I would also like to thank uh, my colleague, Justin Dunavant, for suggesting me as a person to, um, to give a lecture in this series. And I, I know it's been a fantastic series. Um, and finally, I would like to thank all of you out in the audience. Even though we can't see each other, I know that you're there. And I want to thank you for spending some part of your afternoon here with me today. So before we begin, I, I always like to start my lectures by giving us a, a, an orientation because there's usually someone in the audience that doesn't know exactly where Nubia is. So where exactly is Nubia? So Nubia is located on the African continent um, and it is south of what was Egypt. Today, the border is at um, here between uh, Sudan and Egypt. In ancient times, the border was here at the first cataract. So then we had uh, the polities were known as Egypt and Nubia. So you can see that the political boundaries have changed since ancient times. And so what was considered Lower Nubia or what archeologists consider Lower Nubia is a part of Southern Egypt. This has been inundated by the Aswan High Dam. So this is all underwater, um, most of this is underwater right now. But this was the ancient society or the ancient geography of Lower Nubia that's shared between Egypt and the current Sudan. And like Egypt, Sudan, um, Nubia was divided into two geographical divisions, Upper Nubia and Lower Nubia. Because the Nile River flows from south to north, the upper portion of the geography is in the south and the lower part of the, ge the geography is in the, the north. So you would travel up south and down north if you're traveling on the Nile River. What is the extent of Nubian history? So we can see that based on the archeological as well as the historical records, we have about 10,000 years worth of occupation of the region that we call Nubia. And I should mention, <clears throat> excuse me, that Nubia is not the name, the actual name of the place, it is the generic name that anthropologists and archeologists have given the region to talk about it through time and space. Um, so it's the geographical space, not necessarily um, the polity or the, the kingdom because there are various groups that move through the landscape. So you can see these archeological periods are basically population groups that have occupied the now um, the Nubian region throughout time, going all the way back past 8,000 BC. And how do we know what we know about Nubia? The sources of information that we have include Egyptian texts, Greek and other contemporary texts and archeology. span Based on the Egyptian texts, we know some of the names that were used for um, different groups or different regions within what we call Nubia. So we have Taseti, which means land of the bow. The, the Nubians were known to be good archers, excellent archers actually. Wawat is the region of lower Nubia. And then around Egypt's sixth dynasty, 
we see the appearance of a, of a name of Kush. And we know that the earlier Kush was located around the third cataract at Kerma. That was the, the capital at the time. And then after um, New Kingdom colonization happened, Egypt came down and colonized Upper Nubia, or came, yeah, they came down north. They came from down north up south to colonize. Um, and after that colonization period ended, then we have a new kingdom of Kush to arrive, arrive, emerge at the fourth cataract. And that one, that particular kingdom of Kush is the one that ends up being the 25th dynasty and going in and conquering and ruling Egypt for a period of time. Other names that we have are Ethiopia. So that's what we find in the Greek text. And the, the word Ethiopia in Greek means land or, or people of the sunburnt face, burnt faces. That's not to be confused with modern Ethiopia. So in the Greek text, the, what you find for um, Ethiopia actually means Nubia. So it's the area south of Egypt. But there's also a connotation um, for the use of Ethiopia that means other parts of Africa that are unexplored. So in reading the Greek text, you can kind of tell that they're not really based on eyewitness accounts because some of the, the descriptions are so outrageous, you know that, okay, nobody saw this, but that is designated as Ethiopia as well. So when you're reading the Greek text, you have to be able to, to um, discern which of the, the, the two Nubi, the, the two Ethiopians they're talking about. But when they're talking about the, the civilization, um, the queens, the kings, the temples, they're talking about Nubia. And one other term that you'll see is Meroe. So that is the second capital of the second Kushite kingdom. So what is my involvement or um, integration into Nubia. So in, um, I had to go back after Kara contact, contacted me about giving a lecture to think, well, what, what will I talk about? What do I want to share? So going back and looking at the presentations that I've given over the years, I went back to my very first one. This was all the way back in 2006 right after the opening of the Hickens Family Nubian Gallery at the Oral Institute. And I want to thank um, Carol Krukoff, I think she's on here. She was the education director or the, over the education department at the time. So she asked me if I would give this presentation because it was in March. And so it, it coincided with Women's History Month and it went over really well. So the Kushite queens, princesses, and venerated mothers have been a part of um, my research and my work going all the way back to 2006. So there are some other presentations that I've done. I picked that one just because I like the color. I thought it was, I did a really good job on making that title slide. So my work has ranged uh, because I, I, my undergraduate degree is in political science. So I've always had this kind of interest in politics, even looking at the ancient world, I'm interested in the relationship between religion and politics, how religion and politics are integrated in, um, and, and used to create um, a just society, to create harmony, so these are the things that I've been exploring and the, the presence of women, especially in the Kushite period. So we have these reigning queens. Um, you also have princesses who are acting as priestesses. And then you have the, the queen mother who is providing the legitimation and also acting uh, at times as a priestess. So they supply, supply support for the king, when you have a reigning king, 
or for the queen when you have a, a queen on the throne. So all of these things are kind of integrated into the work that I do and, and into my dissertation. But for, for this particular um, presentation, I started going back to a presentation that I did uh, about a, a little over a year ago about the historiography. And that comes from my chapter, my history chapter in my dissertation. But I began to reimagine how I would talk about this given all of the things that have happened in the past year. But in thinking about African-American engagement with Nubian history, I began to go back over the ways in which Nubia has figured into the cultural imagination in recent times. As a Gen Xer, I came into adulthood when Nubia was making a resurgence into popular culture. 1989 saw the introduction of Brand Nubian, an energetic hip hop group using rap as a form of social and political commentary. In 1999, two French African sisters, Les Nubian, broke into the US R&B music scene combining soulful rhythms and French lyrics to celebrate African culture and history. Their debut song, Makeda, extolled the beauty and power of the Ethiopian Queen Makeda, known as the Queen of Sheba, and claimed her legacy for all African people. The 80s and 90s were also a time when the term Nubian made its way into the African-American vernacular. Moving from the title of Brothers and Sisters of the 1970s, socially, socially conscious Black people began greeting each other as my Nubian brother or my Nubian sister. Here, Nubian took the identification beyond a recognition of shared Blackness to a deeper level of shared noble Africanness. Moreover, the highest compliment that a man, a Black man could offer a Black woman was to call her a Nubian queen. Prior to both of these move movements, however, DC Comics in 1973 introduced a new side character named Nubia. It was later revealed that Nubia was another Wonder Woman and that she was Princess Diana's long lost twin sister who had been abducted as a baby by the god Mars. In 2000, Nubia was reintroduced in a new comic universe in which she was the gatekeeper to the underworld. But in October of 2020, DC Comics announced that Nubia would be taking up the mantle of the Wonder Woman after the death of Diana Prince. Yet despite these popular encounters, the true Nubia of the ancient world was largely unknown in the US. But this past year has given us the opportunity for seriously re-examining the ways knowledge about the ancient Nile Valley has been conceptualized and produced. This moment of publicly acknowledged social injustice has provoked a critical time of self-reflection in many academic and cultural, in cultural heritage institutions. But the calls to confront and redress the endemic racism woven into the very fabric of the history and theory of the academy is not new. In the late 19th to early 20th centuries, a battle was brewing over the place of Nubia and Egypt in world history and where their conceptual and intellectual centers should be. One side possessed the academic authority and institutional power to ignore and silence the oppositional views of the socially marginalized other. Consequently, the very existence of this conflict is preserved only in the alternative archives of the marginalized party. For the mainstream scholars of Egyptology and history, the side endowed with, with institutional authority and power, there was no conflict. This was merely a time of staking and protecting their claim to the forms of knowledge production that enabled them to write the official histories for the Nubian and Egyptian past. For the opposing side, 
African descended people in the Americas, a people not only excluded from mainstream academic institutions and organizations, but from mainstream society itself, reclaiming Nubian and Egyptian history for Africa was essential for reclaiming their own sense of history and establishing proof of their humanity within the context of a world system that sought to deny them both. This lecture will examine the racial bias that was embedded in early Egyptology and how it manifested in the theories and interpretation of the study of ancient Nubia. It will also highlight the efforts of late 19th and early 20th century black writers and historians to produce counter narratives that situated Nubia and Egypt back into their African context. And finally, it will address the obstructionist behavior, i.e. gatekeeping by mainstream academics that undermine the work of black scholars in the effort to exclude them from access to primary knowledge production and from contributing to mainstream academic thought. In the modern academic tradition, the first to stake its claim on Nubian history was Egyptology. But we must remember that the academic disciplines are a fairly recent creation. Egyptology, anthropology, and archeology span all emerged from the same intellectual matrix of enlightenment ideas and questions regarding the constitution of societies and their general research questions often overlapped. In Britain, early Egyptologists considered Egyptology to be a branch of anthropology. Francis Griffith said exactly this in his inaugural lecture as Oxford's first reader in Egyptology. Several British Egyptologists, including Flinders Petrie, held active membership in, presided over, and published in the journals of several anthropological associations. Egyptology in the US lacked this direct connection with anthropology, but Breasted and Reiser fully relied upon anthropological theories of biological evolution and racial, and racial hierarchy. The racialized theories of social and human evolution, hierarchies of racial character, and biological and mental fitness that were developed within Egypt, within anthropology, were used to naturalize international economies of power, social inequalities, and structures of dominance. This naturalization in turn furthered European colonial projects by providing a justifiable basis for enslavement and the colonial domination of foreign peoples, lands, and resources. The combined scientific racism and colonial mindset found within anthropology permeated all areas of the humanities and social sciences. And this is the intellectual environment within which Egyptological approaches and theories were developed. That is not to suggest that early Egyptologists were unwitting borrowers of racist theory, for there were some who were actively involved in supplying the scientific means, Petrie, or data, G. Elliott Smith, for supporting theories of racialized biological difference and eugenics. However, their use of these anthropological theories fostered the embedding of the West, the academies, and their own personal biases into the framing and interpretation of Nile Valley history. Interpreting the Egyptians' depictions of the Nubians with dark chocolate skin as an indication that the Egyptians regarded the Nubians as an inferior biological and racialized other, Egyptologists used anthropological theories of evolution, culture history, diffusion and migration to support their own presuppositions about the Nubians and to label the Nubian culture as an adulterated form of Egyptian culture whose civilization, crafts and statehood were brought to Nubia by Egyptians and whose rise and fall was due respectively to the Nubians admixture with Caucasian Egyptians from the North or Black Negro African populations from the South. However, the Nubian problem could not be disposed of by simply creating a category of otherness. For in the minds of Egyptologists, while the, while the Nubians were not 
yet as advanced or not as advanced as the Egyptians, they were at least capable of imitating a civilization. Moreover, this debased copy proved itself capable of rising up and assuming rulership over the original. This was the conundrum that Egyptologists faced while functioning within a world system that had enslaved and colonized people from the African continent who shared the same dark skin with which the Nubians were portrayed on royal monuments. The scientific racism that provided the ethical justifications for enslavement, the slave trade, colonialism, and all of their attending exploitations also imposed and reinforced limits on what was deemed thinkable within contemporaneous modes of Western thought. Michelle Roth Trio's Silencing the Past is instructive for its illustration of how the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804 was unthinkable for European intellectuals within the context of Western philosophical thought during the period of European colonialism and enslavement in the Americas. This unthinkability by Western scholars left the Haitian Revolution unremarked, unwritten, and hence intentionally silenced, or at least in mainstream academic archives. Likewise, for Egyptologists and anthropologists, it was unthinkable that any indigenous African people, including the then colonized people of Sudan, who Reisner derisively described as a population sunk to a half savage state would have a connection to the ancient people who overtook and ruled a powerful state that had previously colonized it. For to make the concession of Africanity to the ancient Nubians would challenge the limits of what was deemed possible for African people to achieve in their own time. This paradox resulted in the creation of another racial and linguistic category to produce yet another classification of otherness for the Nubians, this time from other Africans. The Hamite theory, already in use in the mid 1800s in the analysis of skulls of pre-dynastic Egyptians, grew to include the Nubians within its purview. This theory was most popularly articulated by the doctor turned ethnologist, Charles Seligman in his 1930 work, The Races of Africa. Relying on the work of British physical anthropologists who had gained a reputation for studying the skeletal remains of Petrie's Egyptian excavations, as well as those from the Nubian archeological surveys, Seligman stated that the Hamites who he classified as pastoral Caucasians had migrated into Africa in waves going back to the pluvial period. In each migration, the Hamites being better armed as well as quicker witted than the dark agricultural Negroes displaced the native population. At the beginning of each new migration wave, the mixed race descendants of the previous migration, who while superior to the pure Negro, would be, would be regarded with disdain by the next incoming wave of Hamites, were pushed further inland to play the part of an incoming aristocracy vis-a-vis -vis the Negroes on whom they impinged. With regard to Northeast Africa, Seligman stated that the pre-dynastic Egyptians and their contemporaries in Lower Nubia were both of this Hamitic race but that by the Middle Kingdom, the Nubians had become a hybrid population, blending the characters of Egyptian, Negro, and Beja that has in the main persisted in Nubia till this day. Though speaking a, Sudan a Sudanic language, the Nubians must be regarded as predominantly Hamitic. Even prior to Seligman's declaration of the Hamitic nature of the Nubians, Anthropologists and Egyptologists had already distinguished the Nubians as non-Negro, something that had been debated earlier in relation to the Egyptians. And I should remark here that uh, Dr. Shamar Kakeda has, um, and if you watch the, the panel that he was on last, last week, he's made uh, the, the comment or the statement that there actually is conflicting statements within Egyptology with these early Egyptologists about the degraded nature 
of the Nubians and early Egyptians. Um, but by this time, there seems to have been more of a concerted effort to try to prove that they were quote unquote non-Negro. According to Jason Thompson in his second volume of Wonderful Things, A History of Egyptology, Grafton Elliott Smith was aghast at the suggestion that the ancient Egyptians were of Negroid origin and rejected it out of hand. But the Nubians presented a complex problem applying what I'm calling the non-Negro at all cost logic, Reisner stated that the Egyptian, that the, the, the Ethiopian, meaning the Nubian, has never been a Negro, although dark colored, but of a mixed race made up of different elements in different ages. According to Herman Yunker, no blacks or Negroes were represented in the Egyptian or Nubian archeological record until the Egyptian New Kingdom. This distinction between the dark colored Hamite and the Negro ran counter to the racial policy that ruled the political, legal, economic, and social lives of blacks in the United States and other parts of the world. Thus, several men and women of African descent challenged what they viewed to be illogical, racially motivated attempts to disassociate Nubians from Africans while also belittling the Nubians' own cultural histories. As one of the platforms for fighting against the racism that affected their daily lives, these writers and historians confronted the academic and scientific racism that denied African people any role in history by exposing the contradictions in the writings of these historical narratives and offering counter narratives that restored Africans and by extension, African descended people to their place in world history. As the fight for the abolition of slavery moved into the realm of public debate, black ministers began publishing, publishing challenges to the version of the Hamite theory used to justify the enslavement and inferior status allotted to blacks. The Hamite curse was based on the biblical story of Noah, whose nakedness his son Ham observed and broadcast to his two brothers. Pro-slavery ministers interpreted Noah's subsequent curse as a pronouncement against Ham that marked his descendants with black skin and condemned them to a life of servitude. Confronting this misreading of biblical text and the incongruous application of the Hamite theory, at once a curse to support the non-Negroid nature of the Egyptians and Nubians, and at the, on the other hand, um, an anthropological theory to support the non negro nature of the Egyptians and Nubians, and on the other hand, a curse to justify the enslavement of Negroes, Black ministers and writers such as Alexander Crummel, the Caribbean Pan-Africanist Edward Wilmot Blyden, Martin Delaney, and Rufus Perry did not question the, ge the Hamite genealogy assigned to the Kushites but rather embraced it. In a turn not envisioned by those espousing the North African's Hamitic lineage, these writers designated Ham as the founder of not only the Kemites or the Egyptians and Kushites, but of all African people. Their critiques focus on the intentional misinterpretation of the relevant passage of scripture by calling attention to the fact that the curse was pronounced explicitly against Ham's son Canaan, the father of the Canaanites, and the one son with no relationship to Africa. Martin Delaney used his medical knowledge to integrate the genetics of his day with biblical and Greek sources to provide a scientific argument for the unity of humankind and an explanation for the difference in pigmentation between races. And I should make the uh, note here that Martin Delaney, um, he had medical knowledge because he had served as uh, an assistant to a doctor at one point in his life. And then he was recruited as one of three black students to Harvard Medical School uh, actually the first black students to attend Harvard Medical School. 
Uh, but after they didn't even get to finish really the whole first semester before there was uh, pressure on the administration from some of the white students. So at the end of that first semester, he and the other two students um, were pressured to, to, to withdraw. But based on the fact, uh, based on his experience as a physician's assistant, in addition to the coursework that he had already, that he did take at Harvard, he was allowed to practice in Pittsburgh's black community. Now, according to Mario Beatty, and Mario Beatty is a, a name that you should know, throughout this, I will be giving you names of people that, that you should be familiar with, or you, you probably don't know, but you should know. Mario Beatty is a, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. Um, he learned and trained in the Middle Egyptian language by um, Dr. Theophile Obinga. So one of the great linguists, one of our great linguists in our, in our culture or our history. Um, but according to Mario Beatty, who wrote an article on Martin Delaney, um, Delaney's Principia of Ethnology was a direct counter to the science of Josiah Knott, Samuel Morton, and particular George Glitton. And these were the main proponents of race science and eugenics in the US. Still util utilizing a biblical framework, however, Delaney integrated the epigraphic material with the biblical text and concluded that Ham, Mizraim, and Cush ruled over a united Nile Valley kingdom with Ham and Mizraim presiding over Egypt and Cush presiding over Ethiopia. According to, also according to Beatty, Delaney's Egyptian translations were his own. So there are a few uh, small short um, hieroglyphic uh, inscriptions that are included in his text. Um, and so his translations were based upon the hieroglyphic transcriptions published by Glitton and while there were errors, he was, which, were, which was common at the stage of, of Egyptian philological development, this distinguishes Delaney as the first African-American to translate and publish an Egyptian text. In 1883, George Washington Williams published The History of the Negro Race in America, one of the first histories of Blacks in the US that moved beyond slavery thereby reconnecting Blacks in the US to an African past and reconnecting the histories of Nubian Kemet or Nubian Egypt to the history of Africa. While Williams spent the first chapter dealing with the Noah Ham Canaan question, he did so not to prove that Ham and Canaan were the progenitors of the Negro races, but that the human race is one and that Noah's curse was not a divine prophecy. Meanwhile, in Paris, a work that is currently experienced a resurgent after its recent translation into English was published by the Haitian lawyer scholar, Antony Furman. A member of the Anthropological Society of Paris, Furman published De l'Egalité des Races Humaines in 1885, or on the equality of, of human races, as a direct challenge to Comte de Gobineau's essay on the inequality of human races. In Furman's work, he openly confronted the anthropological theories and approaches of racial classification and hierarchy, including craniometry that were used to classify black and other non-European peoples and societies, particularly his native Haiti. He also challenged anthropological and Egyptological approaches used to distinguish Egypt and Nubia as non-African by using Greek sources to support his argument of their inherent Africanity and consequently to refute the premise of African inferiority. There were others actively engaged in confronting these interpretations. In a publication out of Omaha, Nebraska, where I am now, right now, George Wells Parker in his 31 page pamphlet, The Children of the Sun, made many of the same assertions that would be more fully explored eight years later by Drusilla Dungy Houston, who also used the histories, chronologies and archeological reports produced by the Egyptologists of her time, 
referencing Petrie, Sace, and Reisner as freely as she referenced Herodotus and Diodorus. Although Oklahoma-based Houston does not mention Wells Parker as an influence, even though he was actively publishing and speaking as a founder of the Hamitic League of the World, uh, neither Parker nor Houston reference each other as an influence, but it's evident that the ideas they both expressed were the outcome of larger discussions taking place in black newspapers and publications, as well as in salons, lectures, and other formal and informal gatherings where blacks were sharing and debating their own ideas, as well as those that were being brought in along the communities by train. And we also have Dr. John G. Jackson. Most of these counter narratives heavily relied upon Greek sources and unfortunately incorporated their errors, such as the view that civilization began in Meroe and later moved into Egypt, or that Ham was deified as the Egyptian god Amun. There was also the tendency to incorporate the trope of blameless Ethiopian, which presented an overly romanticized view of Nubian cultures and history. Moreover, by using the same anthropological, archeological, and Egyptological theories as the mainstream academicians against whose interpretations they were arguing, some of these interpretations found in these counter narratives fell prey to the same fate of theoretical outdatedness as their counterparts. However, this does not diminish the impact of their efforts to counter mainstream disciplinary and interpretive biases especially given the fact that the only tools they had at their disposal were the works produced by the academics against whom they were fighting. Yet the most formidable critique against African historical decentering leveled at the theoretical integration of racial bias in Egyptology came from an African American who has come to be regarded as one of the most influential scholars of the 20th century, W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois is not often associated with ancient history, but in his three works of ancient history, each serving as a revised updated version of his predecessor, Du Bois used archeological and historical sources to create a historical counter narrative for both Nubia and Egypt. And I will mention here, uh, Vanessa Davies is working on a monograph exploring Du Bois's work and influence in Egyptology. So we're really looking forward to that. But he published The Negro in 1915, followed by Black Folk Then and Now in 1939, and The World in Africa in 1947. Each used the most recent archaeological and historical data to correct and further elaborate his theory of African history. Du Bois's works were influential not just because of the impact it had on the succeeding generation of Black historians and writers, but also for the epistemological challenges that it presented to the prevailing historical narratives. Du Bois's first challenge dealt with the contradiction implicit in the Hamite theory, which was the definition of the Negro. He writes, what is a Negro? We find the most extraordinary confusion of thought and difference of opinion. There's a certain type in the minds of most people which as David, David Livingston said, can be found only in caricature and not in real life. When scientists have tried to find an extreme type of black, ugly and woolly haired Negro, they have been compelled more and more to limit his home even in Africa. At least nine tenths of the African people do not at all conform to this type. And the typical Negro after being denied a dwelling place in the Sudan, along the Nile, in East Central Africa and in South Africa was finally given a very small country between the Senegal and the, and the Niger. And even there was found to give trace of many stocks. As Winwood Reed says, the typical Negro is a rare variety even among Negroes. As a matter of fact, we cannot take such extreme and largely fanciful stock as typifying that which we may fairly call the Negro race. In the case of no other race is, no, is so narrow a definition attempted. In fact, it is generally recognized today 
that no scientific definition of race is possible. Now, Du Bois is writing this in 1915. There is no scientific, that no scientific definition of race is possible. And Du Bois was also in, in, in conversation with Franz Boas, so I should mention that. So he was having conversations with Boas, who also was, uh, as, an, as an anthropologist, was very much trying to disprove a lot of the racial theories that were prevalent in, in anthropology. In Black Folk Then and Now, he summarized the effect of this contradiction on the historiography of Sudan. In Ethiopia and in what is now in what is known as the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, we have preeminently a land of the Black race from prehistoric times. And yet today, by a narrow and indefensible definition, the connection even of Ethiopia with Negro history is denied. While the Sudan is left as a sort of historical no man's land and is regarded now as Arabian, now as Egyptian, now as Hamitic, and always as not worth careful investigation and study. Its events have been misinterpreted and its heroes like the Mahdi maligned and written down as the cause of that very misery and turmoil against which, against which they rebelled and fought. Such at the hands of modern science has been the fate. Secondly, Du Bois was explicit in his challenge to the authority given to the interpretations offered by Egyptologists. I feel now as though I were approaching a crowd of friends and enemies who ask a bit breathlessly, whose and whence is the testimony on which I rely for something that even resembles authority? To which I return two answers. I am challenging authority. Even Maspero, says. Reisner, Breasted, and hundreds of other men of highest respectability who did not attack, but studiously ignored the Negro on the Nile and in the world and talked as though black folk were non-existent and unimportant. They are part of the herd of writers of modern history who never heard of Africa or who declare with Gurnier, sur le tous les continents l'Afrique n'est pas d'histoire. Alone of all the continents, Africa has no history. Finally, Du Bois in seeing the need to make use of the latest archeological data also expressed the need to separate the data from their interpretations. The works of Sir Ernest Budge, George A. Reisner, A. H. Sace, and F. L. Griffith have naturally been of use when they were not indulging their opinions about Negroes. While discussing racial bias in Egyptology, little attention has been given to the exclusion of people deemed to be black from both the theorization of the ancient Nile Valley and from the actual work of early Egyptology. Not only did black intellectuals have to confront the general impersonal bias found in Egyptological and anthropological theory, some also had to experience the direct personal bias wielded by those with academic and institutional influence to ensure that they remained outside of the academic mainstream. Revealing these biases are important for understanding the additional layer of racial preconception that early Egyptologists brought into their interpretations as well as their historic, historiographical approaches. The cases of Du Bois and Hansberger are illustrative of the role that the personal racial bias of Egyptologists and Africanists and their gatekeeping practices played in keeping university trained blacks from entering these fields and even entering into constructive debates over approaches to the study and our interpretation of Africa's ancient past. In her 2018 presidential address to the African Studies Association, Jean Alma led her colleagues in the uncomfortable task of critically examining the history of the organization and the field of African studies to assess the reasons for their respective lack of diversity, reasons that other scholars raised in the past, but the discipline and organization still had not addressed. And I want to thank um, Salim Faraji for um, 
making bringing this uh, video to my attention. If you have not seen it, it is excellent. You need to sit and watch it and you probably want to watch it again because she gives out so much information. But in the course of her speech, Allman leveled a critique against the founders of African studies and the ASA for engaging in practices and erecting institutional barriers that effectively prevented black scholars and black institutions from participating in the formation and development of the discipline. At the heart of this discussion was Melville Herskovitz, the purported father of African studies. Herskovitz is well known, uh, well known and well recognized for his research and advocacy promoting the study of African culture and history. Yet his efforts to marginalize, silence, and even exclude black scholars are only recently coming to light. In particular, and this is the uh, book published by Jerry Gershenhorn that, and it's also an excellent book for going into the details of the things that, that Jean Alma brings up in her, her speech. Um, Gershenhorn highlights the problematic relationship that Herskovitz had with black scholars at HBCUs. Excluded from teaching positions at predominantly white institutions, black scholars developed their own pedagogical and epistemological approaches to history. And more importantly, they were actively engaged in the study of African history decades before Africa was deemed worthy of study in predominantly white institutions. The critiques of Allman and Gershenhorn are important to Egyptology in two ways. First, the instances of Herskovitz gatekeeping that they both describe were part of a more, much larger current within mainstream academia that effectively excluded black and other non-white scholars from its ranks and deprived them of the tools and funding for conducting their own primary research. Second, their critiques provide a basis for analyzing how these obstructionist interventions in African studies had disciplinary consequences for both African studies and Egyptology by reifying the epistemological, theoretical, and methodological divisions between them. In essence, their inclusion, meaning inclusion of the Black scholars rather than exclusion, would have produced a far different disciplinary configuration than what we see at present. And here we arrive at William Leo Hansberry. William Leo Hansberry was, is actually the person who should be considered the father of African studies. He is the father of African studies in the United States. The primary reason why his contributions are not known is first of all, he spent his life working in HBCUs so away from the funding and the, uh, the academic prevalence or, or visibility that derives from working in a predominantly white institution. But also he was never able to, um, to achieve getting his PhD. So let me tell you about, a bit about William Leo Hansberry. He came to Howard University um, in 1922. The primary reason for his acceptance of Howard and Howard gave him a, a very paltry, very sadly paid offer of employment. But he accepted Howard's uh, offer of part-time employment over a much more lucrative offer from Atlanta University because of its proximity to the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and by a short train ride to Harvard. Now, William Leo Hansberry received a BA in history with a minor in anthropology and a master's degree from Harvard University. As his advisor, the physical anthropologist Ernest Hooten expressed to the Howard administration when he was trying to, to take a sabbatical as well as when he was writing up a grant proposal, there was no one in the United States who knew as much about Africa as Hansberry. 
and thus there was no one qualified to supervise his dissertation. Yet aside from these issues and his repeated attempts to gain foundational funding for an African studies program at Howard, um, Hansberry's life demonstrates how paternalism was used as a subtle form of gatekeeping against black scholars trying to gain access to mainstream primary knowledge production. In this case, it was used to dissuade him from participating in archeological excavation in the Nile Valley. Uh, so I'm trying to skip ahead. So one thing to know about um, Professor Hansberry is that when he arrived in, uh, at Howard, he basically created the, the ancient studies section of their history department. And he taught, he believed in a holistic approach to African history. He taught, his classes started with the stone age and continued all the way up to contemporary time. So that is the long durée of African history. That's what's missing in our current formations, our, form of, uh, our formal disciplinary formations is that long durée. Within two years of coming to Howard, he's had his classes, he had taught over 800 students. Wrap your brain around that. Two years, over 800 students had taken his classes. So this shows how effective he was. This shows that there was a hunger for the knowledge that he had. And this is in 1920. So the, in predominantly white institutions weren't even thinking about Africa because they said that Africa had no history. That was the theoretical conception. Africa has no history, so there is no history for us to study. But this man has put together this whole, a whole series of coursework at Howard to create African studies. And Howard University has to do a lot to make up for all the ways that they did not recognize him when he was there, when the 30 years, that, 30 plus years that he worked there. Um, he did not get the recognition and the respect that he so, he just deserved all the respect and all of the claim that they could have given him, but they did not. So Howard University has a lot to make up for in that regard. But going back to his, his, his desire to, to go and excavate, so, he understood that the key to creating credible counter narratives was the ability to formulate research questions and conduct the necessary field research in pursuit of those answers, in pursuit of answers. So he worked toward gaining the necessary training to include in his own primary research into his larger scholarly agenda. And, and I should say also that after he received his MA degree and he was teaching at Howard, he spent years trying to find someone to supervise his dissertation. Um, and, and in fact, like Houghton said, there was no one in the United States. So he even went abroad and was looking in England. And so he was in conversation with, with Petrie and with uh, Francis Griffith and with Sace and with all of the major Egyptologists in, in, um, in Egypt, in, in um, in England, trying to get the knowledge that he needed. He, he took coursework at the University of Chicago. Um, he was in Oxford. So he was actively pursuing the research to do the work, but it's just that his research agenda was so large and so expansive that, I, that no one person was able to actually uh, step in and, and supervise the work and, and to be to serve as his advisor. Um, but having learned that Francis Griffith was planning archeological expedition to the upper Nubian temple site at Kawa, Hansberry sought the advice of Dows Dunham, the assistant curator of Egyptian art at the Museum of Fine Arts to see if he thought it would be wise to approach Griffith to ask if he could join his team. Even though he already had developed an ongoing correspondence with Griffith in his international search for a dissertation supervisor, 
It appears that Hansberry approached Dunham to see what training he needed since Dunham had excavated in Sudan with Reisner. Now Kwame Alford, who wrote his dissertation on uh, Professor Hansberry, made a note also that he understood that there might be some racial reasons that might prohibit him or might cause some kind of hindrance for him being on the team. So that was another reason for him asking Dunham's advice. Um, Hansberry had a re relationship with Dunham, both Dunham and Reisner from having taken classes from them both at Harvard. In his response, Dunham gave several reasons why he regarded it to be an unwise idea. His first reasoning was on the basis that Hansberry lacked the archeological experience. However, knowing Hansberry's initiative firsthand and that he had time to remedy that deficiency, Dunham stated the real reason for his dissent. To be perfectly frank with you, if I were in charge of such an expedition, I should hesitate long before taking an American Negro on my staff. I should fear that the mere fact of your being a member of the staff would seriously affect the prestige of the other members and the respect which the native employees would have for them. I feel sure that you know me well enough to realize that I do not say this out of any feeling of race prejudice. According to Harris, Hansberry most likely was not surprised by Dunham's response. Some have argued that Dunham was not being racist, that he was just a man of his time, but that is precisely the point. The scientific and social racism of the time was so embedded in academia at both the theoretical and personal levels, the comments or actions made with no overt conscious racist intent had real racist effects and effects against the recipients of those non-hurt intending com comments or actions. Although Dunham prefaces statements with, I don't do this out of any feeling of racial prejudice, his logical assessment and determination were made solely on the basis of race and his advice which was meant to dissuade Hansberry's participation on this archeological excavation was and is by definition racist. So when we consider the counter narratives and historical projects of scholars like Du Bois and Hansberry, we can see how different epistemological orientations can produce vastly different disciplinary and theoretical approaches to research and the knowledge produced. From this alternative position, one can wonder at the logic and rationale for establishing the first formal program of African studies at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, which is Northern Cook County, with no relationship with the country's first program of Egyptology at the University of Chicago in South Cook County, which is a scant 20 miles away. This disciplinary disconnect has and continues to impoverish African studies through its failure to study the long durée of social formations, migrations, processes, and change throughout Africa's history by excluding its earliest polities. Likewise, Egyptology has been impoverished by its failure to adequately study Egypt in relation to and not in, dem, in, not in domination of Nubia, as well as its failure to situate and study both in the context of the larger archeological study of the African continent. And I will make another plug here, um, Shayla, Mon uh, Shayla Monroe, at the University of California, Santa Barbara is doing this research. Um, so if you get a chance, go on YouTube, the Bade Museum, B-A-D-E, it was still doing a series on Nubia. And she talks about um, the cattle culture. So these, these uh, 
migrate migrating people that have these the cattle these cattle cultures are essential for talking about the early pre pre dynastic periods of Egypt and also what's going on in Nubia. So talking about the migration histories, the domestication of cattle, uh, all of this is part of talking about African archeology. span So if you fail to take into, into consideration African archeology, span you're missing a, a component of understanding this early period of the formation of the Egyptian state and also the formation of some of the ideologies and some of the culture, that aspect is missing. So all of this raises the additional thought of how differently our interpretations and historical narratives would be if mainstream academics had worked with, collaborated with, or at least dialogued with Hansberry and integrated his holistic epistemological approach to African history rather than actively working to exclude black voices from serious intellectual consideration. As uh, Justin Donovan rightly states, had Hansberry been successful in his attempt to establish an African studies program, the structure of African studies in America may have been very different with ancient African history and archeology span placed at the center of the discourse. And I would add the same applies to Egyptology. The mid 20th century bore witness to a changing tide of social and intellectual awareness. Liberation movements across Africa, Asia, and in the Americas fomented a change in how we conceptualize ancient African history and, and ancient African history in Nubia. Although Du Bois's writing of ancient history was disregarded by the mainstream academics engaged in crafting Nubia's history, the bases of all three of his critiques would find vindication in the work of the post Aswan Dam Nubian archaeologists in their creation of a new paradigm for approaching Nubian studies. And taken together, the works of all of these writers, despite their shortcomings, and the fact that their critiques were ignored in mainstream academia. The works of Williams, Houston, Furman, and Du Bois, as well as those of John Jackson, William, William Leo Hansberry, as well as many unnamed others, raised the first substantive critiques against the racial biases inherent in the interpretation of the Nubian archeological record. And in this, they predated the later critiques of Egyptological bias raised by Sheikh Andrzej Theophilo Benga, John Henry Clark, Jacob Carruthers, Malana Karenga, and others. Moreover, their work demonstrated the first real efforts to examine Nubia from its own perspective, foretelling a paradigmatic shift in mainstream academia that would seek to integrate the histories of ancient African societies like Nubia into a larger African historiography. So with that, I welcome your comments. These are some of our elders who have been more recently involved in the work in Nubia. I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. Awesome. Uh, that was absolutely amazing, Deborah. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated your necessary critique on the thought collective that has been entrenched within Nubian and Egyptian archaeology and how we can carve new ways forward. I'm just blown away and I'm sure many others are and we already have questions rolling in and uh, participants raised hands. So um, if you do have questions, I invite you to put them in the chat, uh, in the Q&A chat, and I will um, read them out loud and hopefully we can have a really cool discussion. Um, so John and Woodford asks, our uh, first states, I've heard lectures on this and related subjects era at Michigan for 40 plus years. And this is the most powerful, intellectually accomplished, insightful, inspiring, and informative one I've heard. 
Is anyone paying attention? <laughs> is anyone paying attention to Bantu culture and history at the level you apply here to Nubias? That is what we. That's what we really want to get. That's the point that we want to arrive at. We want to be able to make these connections across the African continent. So the um, the Hansberry Society that uh, just recently formed. We're working to, to make the connections, first of all, in the Nile Valley, so with Nubian Egypt, and then also extending to Ethiopia. Uh, but we also want to start making those connections to the West. Uh, and actually, An Anissa Malvoisin, so again, I'm dropping another name. She's at the University of Toronto. She's a graduate student at the University of Toronto. Uh, and she's doing her dissertation looking at the relationship between um, medieval Nubia and the trade routes to into West Africa. So there is an interest in doing this. Um, we just have to make those connections. And, and, and I think that Egyptology and African studies, they both have to be willing to, to free up that space to, to make those kinds of connections and start making those, those inroads uh, between the disciplines. You're muted. I am muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John, for your question. Uh, Michelle says, thank you, Deborah. Um, Charles Williams uh, asks, what or did Roman uh, Empire building play a role in colonizing efforts? Did. Uh, what did Ro what or did Rome Empire building play a role in colonizing efforts? Is how the question is stated. Okay, so so Rome, uh, when Rome invaded Egypt, they actually pushed southward into Lower Nubia. So they they did move into um, that area between the the first and second cataracts. Um, but by that time, there were uh, powerful rulers at Meroe. So the the kingdom, the the Kushite kingdom. Uh, the capital had moved a little bit further south uh, between the fifth and sixth cataracts. Uh, but the, the, you, had a, oh, you had a reigning queen on the throne at the time, uh, Amanorinus. And so Amanorinus actually went to battle with her troops against the Romans. So they, they, there were these, these fights that kept going on and on to eventually they had to, there was a, a peace treaty signed with the Romans, because the Romans were like, this woman, this one-eyed woman, she's not stopping. <laughs> they're, gonna, they're gonna keep coming. So they actually signed a peace treaty with the, with the Nubians. Excellent. Um, Isabel uh, says, wow, what a wonderful talk. Uh, loads to digest. I was wondering why was Howard University so difficult towards Hansberry? That's a very good question. Um, so one thing to understand about um, HBCUs, especially in that, that time period, people were trying to become a part of society, the American society, they wanted to be recognized. So they had been marginalized for so long. So people were feeling as if, if you could be educated, then you could be accepted by the larger society. So HBCUs tended to be very conservative. So uh, when Professor Hansberry, and, and, and I will say that what Professor Hansberry was teaching, he was decades ahead of everybody else. So the, there were a couple of professors at Howard um, that were pressuring the, the administration saying, you know, he's teaching this stuff. Uh, he, we don't believe it's true. So he, he's teaching this stuff and, 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 and it's gonna affect our reputation. So they actually went to the, the administration um, and, and basically which were trying to, I don't know if they were trying to get him fired, but they were trying to get him out of the classroom. So there was uh, an investigation and the administration eventually decided to, to give him back the classes, uh, but they took away the funding that he had for the class. So. Uh, the, the other thing that I will say, he was doing all of this research 
um, at, at Harvard, at the Library of Congress. He was on top of all of the archeology span that was coming out. So he was, he had amassed like all of this, this information. He was spending his own money making copies of archeological reports of books, um, making lantern slides to use for his classes. So in teaching his classes, again, I told you, there's no African studies before him. So in order to teach his students, he's creating the text to use for his classes. So his students are getting primary research. That's what they're using for their classes. Um, so, I, and I can imagine that's probably why his, his, his classes were just, how do you teach 800 students in two years? It's just mind blowing. Um, but yeah, so part of, part of uh, what Al, uh, Kwame Alfred says is that part of the, this push of, with these professors where they, they also were jealous of all of these students that were, were taking his courses. So there was some professional jealousy involved as well. But I just think part of it too is that they could not conceive of the information that he was giving them because he was so far ahead of them intellectually as far as all of this. this I mean, and, and even imagine this, Harvard University, as vast as Harvard was, you know, and Harvard's supposed to be the epitome of, you know, intellectual work at this time, they don't have not a single person or a group of people that could supervise this man's dissertation. So he was just so far ahead of everybody that they just could not conceive of what he was talking about. That's crazy. <laughs> it didn't even have somebody for him. I know. Yeah, it's a shame. Uh, we set, we have lots of questions rolling in. Um, we have another one. Thank you so much for such an illuminating talk. I'm curious, what would what you think post-revolution archaeology looks like in Sudan going forward? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the thing is that Sudan since since its revolution in the 70s has his own archaeologists um they don't get the the recognition that the western archaeologists get when they come there but sudan has its own archaeologists so they have at the university so peter shinney when he was teaching at the university of khartoum one of the things that he made as a part of his priority was to train Sudanese to be archaeologists, to profess and be professional archaeologists. So they are in charge of the antiquity service. Um, they go out as inspectors and they have their own archaeological field sites. Um, but I think that post-revolution, hopefully that will just continue to grow. And also, um, I should mention that that um, that AMSARC, that, that part of their mission is to build those relationships between um, archaeologists from the U.S. and archaeologists in Sudan. So there's um, collaboration and, and field work um, going forward. Well, that perfectly ties into the next question uh, by Jeff Eberling. Uh, <laughs> He says, thanks, Deborah. I'm wondering whether you see points of connection between Black American engagement with Nubia and the work of Sudanese and Egyptian scholars. Yes, yes. And, and there has to be connection because um, we, in order to, to make this really work, first of all, people have to buy in, or I don't want to say buy in, but we have to have this general understanding that these Nile Valley civilizations, these Nile Valley cultures are African. So that whole discussion about, yes, Egypt is in Africa, that makes it African, but it's not of Africa, meaning African people have nothing to do with it. That, that is irrational. 
it's situated there on the African continent. Homo sapiens has been on the African continent for 200,000 years, moving around the continent. So Egypt is a part of Africa and Africans are a part of Egypt. So there has to be that basic understanding. Um, and I think that what African descended people in the diaspora bring is the fact that, you know, since we have been removed from our homelands, we have the, we have, uh, the perception of being able to see Africa as a, as a totality, as a unit, as opposed to looking at different groups. So we see the groups and we're like, okay, yes, I understand you're part of this group, but you also are African. We're all African. So if we can get to, the, get to that, you know, bring that basic understanding, um, then I think we all can, can move this ahead and it, and it can get to be really more productive. Um, yeah, so yes, I, I thank you for that, Jeff. Um, that, that also ties into the Africanist archeology. span African studies has to go back and reclaim ancient Africa. African studies has been negligent in that. And part of that, if you read Gershenhorn's book, Gershenhorn is an, that's an excellent resource, but he explains or he gives us a, a, a really good understanding of why African studies is formed the way, it, way that it is politically, because it, there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of things happening behind the scenes with the government as far as funding. And, and the government didn't want to fund ancient Africa because they had no interest in ancient Africa. They had interest in contemporary Africa. So they wanted to know about its government its economy, its politics. So they funded African studies, but in a contemporary form, so slightly historical, but not dealing with ancient history. And I think now at this time when we're reassessing and looking at how we can refigure our, our disciplines and, and our fields of study, African studies has to go back and reclaim ancient Africa. Excellent. I love that point. Um, <clears throat> we have another question kind of similar. Amazing presentation. Uh, what are the connections and the study of Nubia between US scholars and contemporary African archaeologists? And how can we learn more about the Leo Hansberry Society? <laughs> All right. So I'll answer the, the, the second one first. That was easy. <laughs> um, so it's uh, hansberrysoc.org is the website. Um, and then Twitter and Instagram is Hansberry SOC as well. So that's, that's the first one. The relationships between, um, we, we're trying to build those relationships between um, African and African-American scholars in the US and, and on the continent. Those are bridges that need to be, get, uh, that, that need to be built. Um, so that is part of the work that we're doing um, with the Hansberry, I mean, the Hansberry Society, we're, the lockdown was game changing for us because we're bringing, people are coming together just like the Zoom session right here. These have been going on all year. And you know, you, you log into a Zoom session and you find people across the country that you never even heard of. They're doing the same work or similar work. And you're like, wow. So that's how we've been like drawing people in. You know, some of it has just been just being on a Zoom session or talking to somebody who, who knew somebody. Um, and, and, and let me say that when we talk about diversifying the disciplines, one of the key ways of diversifying is just by asking, do you know anybody else? So, I mean, if you identify one person Maybe that person knows another person. And so that's how we've been able to build. But I think that's something that, um, that we're going to have to continue to do. And especially, let me say this also, we need to make more use of our graduate students. Graduate students, especially when you're writing your dissertation, 
you have been doing this work for a while and you have something valuable to say. And if your dissertation was on something that already exists, there's no, there's no need for you to write a dissertation because you're supposed to be expanding knowledge. So these, these uh, graduate students who are writing dissertations, they are, they are creating new knowledge. So don't dismiss them. I, I've, I've, I've encountered this in the past few months, this attitude, and, and, and especially with, 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 um, with students of color, you're not gonna find a bunch of us with PhDs because we don't have them yet. <laughs> but you will find some that are working on getting PhDs. How about you reach out to them and extend them opportunities and talk to them and see if you can give them some assistance so that they can become your colleagues? Yes, absolutely. Um, this one's really cute. This is a great lecture, my dear. Great hour spent with you, mom. <laughs> what? Yep. <laughs> Who was that? Oh, Wayland. <laughs> oh, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. Um, we have another comment here. Student of Mario uh, Betty here. Okay, and Howard alumna, also former student and an attendee of the HU annual trip to um, Kemet, I'm not sure. Yes. So grateful to have attended this talk today. It was excellent. Um, we have another question. Uh, ancient Egyptian history always had the role of the cradle of Western civilizations, which supported these colonized epistemologies. Uh, what should be the role of ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia past now to criticize the Western narrative made universal by white academia? That's a good question. All of these are good questions. <laughs> You know, well, first of all, the way that I am starting to think about Egypt and Nubia is less separate, especially in, in the early periods, but looking at Egypt and Nubia as a continuum, a Nile Valley continuum, um, as far as, as, as culture and, and some other things go. But as far as talking about how do we address the this 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 Greek narrative the narrative that that Egypt is um, well I guess it's a part of that whole Egypt being Mediterranean and not being African um, is how is how that that actually kind of started to but to 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 redress or to to get back at that I think the first thing that needs to happen is that we purposely and intentionally resituate. Egypt back into Africa. That's the first, first step. And, and acknowledge the connections that Egypt has on the continent. Then when you deal with that, um, you know, the, the relationship with, with, with Greece, you know, the Greeks, and, and, and we know that, that some of the knowledge that the, the, the Greeks acquired, they, they came to Egypt and studied at Alexandria. Some of, the, some of the most noted Greeks did. But I mean, how, how do we start, you know, disentangling that? And basically you just have to just do the work showing the discrepancies or, or showing, you know, um, I mean, that's, that, that, that takes somebody that's a historian. So in this, this work, there's so much work to be done. And no one person or no one group can do all of the work. So if, you, if that is something that is really interesting to you and you're really fired up about it, I would say go pursue those, this, uh, you know, just do a deep dive into the history, um, the Greek writings, 
and, and make, start making those comparisons with what you see in, in Egypt, um, you won't find the contemporaneous stuff because the library of Alexandria burned, but you know, so, so there's a gap there. But if you can do a deep dive into the Greek writings, maybe you can make some, some parallels or, or um, work backwards and look at things in Egypt at an earlier time that correlate to that. But that's going to be, that's a whole different uh, area of research. And this is a long and hard area of research. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, just, I, I say, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so I do wanna be cognizant of our time and all, for all of our attendees. Um, I'll just do one more question um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what other methods can we use to reclaim the history of ancient Africa and parts of the continent where archaeological methods may not yield as many fruits because of environmental factors? Uh, for example, the forest zones of West Africa. Hmm. Okay. Well, the, the, the work of reclaiming or actually just even recording African history is not just archaeological. It involves um, all of the other sciences. So, and, and that's the good thing about African studies. African studies is interdisciplinary. So it isn't just archeology, span it isn't, isn't just history, but I, I think that too is an area that African studies needs to dig down deeper into is integrating all of these other sciences into it. So um, geological work, linguistic work, and in linguistics, let me mention the name of, of Dr. Chris Errett, who is fantastic with weaving together the linguistics, the cultural material, the, the archaeology, and, and creating, you know, just the synthesis. Um, he has a lecture, he did the Du Bois lecture at Harvard that you can watch on YouTube. And I just love, you know, he he started out on one of the lectures saying, you know, Egypt is in Africa. But most importantly, Egypt is of Africa. So he's he's one of those that that's an Africanist that makes that connection with the ancient past. Uh, but I think that we have to begin to explore all of these other areas of research on the African continent because Africa is it's amazing. Um, just geologically, you have all of these different kinds of geological formations that are together on one continent. You've got the paleo paleoanthropology, um, and and that's one area that I think can really use more uh, more students going into is the the paleoanthropology because uh, the, they they just found some some um, early human species or. or in, in South Africa, like this past week, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's so much work to be done. Africa is a huge continent. So, I mean, I say, if you're interested in any of those sciences, any of the sciences, you can find some way to apply it on the African continent. I love ending on the very holistic anthropology um, note. And I, no, I'm not the only one to say that I am completely blown away by this presentation. And once again, as clear with all the uh, comments uh, within the Q&A, uh, this was such a great and informative talk. So I want to thank you, Deborah. Thank you, thank everyone you. who has attended. Yes, um, thank you all. <laughs> and, and I want to say, I don't know if she's still here, Ms. Gail Hansberry, I saw that she was logged on. That is Professor William Leo Hansberry's daughter. Yes. So if she's still here, thank you for, for coming. Yes, absolutely. And thank you, everybody. Um, and our we have one more speaker series left. Uh, we hope to see you there and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.